Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out. My name is Michael Sheehy. I have the um, joy of introducing Alejandro Chol, who's our guest speaker today, the first in this um, first speaker we've had this whole semester in the contemplative research and scholarship series. And uh, yeah. Ale and I, uh, he goes by Ale, Alejandro, uh, we've known each other for what, six, seven years, maybe seven, eight years. He's um, sort of coming home here to UVA, right? He did your master's here, yeah. University of Virginia. So he's a who, and um, went on and did his, his PhD at Rice University and um, studying forms of yoga that were developed in Tibet. Um, particularly of one tradition called the Bun tradition, which has multiple systems of yoga, physical exercises. And um, has studied these yogic techniques in a variety of settings, both historical settings based on the literature, and uh, which his dissertation is about. He's written two books, translations of these uh, practice systems, yoga practice systems into English from the Tibetan, and has also worked in applications of these yogas in clinical settings, which he's going to talk to us about today. So a kind of wide variety, both working the interface um, of scientists and, and clinicians in treatment, uh, but also pulling them from the historical context, from the historical literary archive, in conversation with living exemplars of the tradition. His most recent book, which you'll give um, a slide about, is called Tibetan Yoga. It's published by Wisdom Publications last year. It's a lovely book, highly recommend it. It's very practical. It, again, brings into kind of very accessible English some of these historical practices. So uh, very happy to have you here, Ale. And without that, uh, with that, uh, you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. It's really great to be here. Yeah, I, uh, 2004 to 2006, I guess I was, uh, no, sorry, uh, when was I? Anyways, somewhere around there. Uh, no, 94 to 96, sorry. I, I, I tried to hide my white hair. But, uh, so 94 to 96, I was here, and I did my master's with David. Um, and at that time, my focus was actually on Chu, which was my first book, and then uh, I moved, when I went to Rice, I moved into areas of Tibetan yoga. And, um, and really, these are two of the monasteries in exile where I learned these. So uh, what you see on your left, Tritanobutse in Nepal, and on your right, Menri Monastery in India. And I love to show the, the image of the Menri Monastery because Menri is also Medicine Mountain. And a lot of my work has been kind of being intertwined, as Michael said, with, with the medical aspect. In fact, my dissertation was about these ancient Tibetan bun yogic practices and applications in contemporary medical systems. Um, and so most of that work I did at MD Anderson, which is a cancer center in Houston, where I'm still there. And um, where I founded the Mind-Body-Spirit Institute at the Jung Center. And a lot of this work couldn't be possible without my teachers and without Ligmincha Institute, which is actually right here, 40 minutes away, um, Serenity to Rich, where if you are interested, tomorrow evening I start a three-day retreat on these uh, Tibetan yogic practices. And... Um, <laughs> and, let me see, and I can't, there we go, and um, <clears throat> this is Yongzin Tenzin Namdak, he's now 98 years old, he's in, in Chitanobutse, and actually my last book that Michael was talking about, I dedicated it to him, and it was, as I say there, through him in 91 that I got into the burn path, and um, and through him, he's been an incredible support all along. And when I'm in difficulties, I would call him and he would say, 
Don't forget we're in samsara. And so usually I visualize him with that incredible smile. And in a way, most of the times, those obstacles dissolve, as in some of the Dzogchen texts say, like snowflakes in water. Um, but when that doesn't happen, that's when I do these magical movements, this Tibetan yoga. So these are some of the teachers. Um, and you've probably seen this. This is a mural in the Lulakang in, in, in Lhasa in Tibet, where it has, amongst other things, many of these Tibetan yogic postures. Uh, if you don't go there, you can see them closer in New York at the Rubin Museum. There's a whole uh, room with these murals. And um, the first Tibetan teacher with whom I learned some of this Tibetan yogas was Namka Rinpoche. And you might know the way that he calls this Tibetan yogas, he calls them Yantra <coughs> Yoga. And this comes from uh, a system by Vairochana uh, in the 8th century. And um, I learned that system, but I really then uh, got really more inclined into these uh, burn systems. And again, this is Lupin Tenzinanda, together with Tenzin Wanjur Rinpoche, who many of you probably know. He's the founder of Ligmin Institute. And um, so here they're actually reading a text back in 2000. And the other teacher I want to mention who passed away a few years back is His Holiness Menri Trizin. And um, he was the abbot of uh, Menri uh, Monastery. And so I learned, I, I was very fortunate to learn with these teachers these traditions. Um, originally, I, I was back in uh, 92, I went to Trita Nobutsu where I learned first time the Shangshu Ninju uh, tradition of Trungkor, a system of Trungkor uh, with a young monk. Uh, that had just come from Amdo, and, um, and in three days, in a floor just like this, uh, we learned all this. We were all much younger. Um, and, um, and it was amazing because, and at that time, I didn't read any Tibetan. Uh, so when I came back to the States, first to Argentina, where I'm originally from, and continued practicing that, and then came to the States, I came and... Uh, with Tenzin Wanda Rinpoche, we went over the whole text, and he then uh, asked me to start sharing this, in, first in small retreats, and then more openly. And then uh, going to uh, Memory Monastery and studying with his soul in his Lumto Tempanima, I studied more the other, another system called the Ati, or the instructions of the uh, now talking about the systems and then applications on how we brought them into contemporary so when we talk about these practices of trunkor or what we call Tibetan yoga, magical movements, they really is salung trunkor in most cases. And, and so sometimes we there is salung and there's trunkor. And salung tsa means channels or nadis, uh, lung means uh, prana or chi or winds, uh, so many different translations. And in particularly in our tradition, the Tsalung practices that we do come from the Maju or the Mother Tantra. So there are more within the tantric systems. And interesting enough, the Trungkor, at least both the system of the Atri and the system of the Shangshu Ninju, come from the Dzogchen tradition. And here you see actually a book that uh, my teacher, Tenzu Wanda Rinpoche, wrote about on these uh, Tsalung from the Mother Tantras, Awakening the Sacred Body. This was actually by Lupin, a translation of that chapter in the Maju, and on top you see the actual picture of that uh, text. And here you see the one on the instructions of the A. Uh, um, also, that was, that's one of my books, the Tibetan Yoga for Health and Well-Being, and the text on top. And finally, the one that Michael was saying, my last book, that it's both on, so the original text that you see up there, uh, is the root text and then the commentary by Shark Story, which I'll mention in a minute. You might think that they're um, actually uh, dirty, but they're actually, those are kind of, you know, fingers of lamas that to kind of blessing, blessing the, the text. Um, um, and, um, and so these are some of the, the teachers within these traditions that are mentioned in this text. 
from Ponjal Sempo uh, and Tokmeshikpo and Lundumutur, Orgon Kundul, Yamton Chempo and Bumjero. And the 19th century uh, translator and also wrote his commentary, Shartzer Rinpoche, who was a very famous uh, both practitioner and, um, and teacher, but also kind of a compiler of um, manuals of practice. Um, and Shartzer Rinpoche, one of the you know, when he passed away in 1934, he became uh, Rainbow Body, which is one of the most, um, you know, significant accomplishments in the in enlightenment in the Dzogchen tradition. Now, let's start going into some of the research. And some of the research, actually, as you can see, Charlottesville, Virginia, maybe you know Jeffrey. I know he's not doing well, so I keep him in heart. So Jeffrey Hopkins, together with Herbert Benson, you might have heard of Herbert Benson, a cardiologist who, uh, for many of us, was more known for his work in the, what he coined the relaxation response, in actually using meditation to find that you can counteract the arousal of the sympathetic system with the balance of the parasympathetic and getting back into a calmer state of mind. And he also then, um, from what I heard from, actually from himself in one of the conferences, he asked his own as the Dalai Lama if he could go and study this Tumo Yoga practice so that he heard that these practitioners, even in the cold, could actually raise their own body heat. And Dalai Lama said yes, and he went to Manali in the lower Himalayas, and he went actually with Jeffrey Hopkins and Mark Epstein and others, and. Um, and he studied this and he found that actually, yes, these lamas, these yogis, could actually raise their body heat. And it was measured and actually published in, in Nature, which is one of the most important um, uh, scientific journals back in the 80s, in the early 80s, 82. Now, then NIH, the National Institutes of Health, started having a part that was related to what at the beginning they called the National Center for Complementary Alternative Medicine, that then became the National Center of Complementary and Integrative Health. And they talked about, they had one area that was the mind-body practices. And this is how they defined them. There are a variety of techniques designed to enhance the mind's capacity to affect bodily functions and symptoms. And then, you know, again, as you know, yoga and these practices became quite popular, and you see them in Time Magazine as the science of meditation, the science of yoga, and how mind can heal your body. Now, more interesting is to see, this is the last census. I know it's a little old, but that was the last census, 2018, when they looked at what happened up to 2017 in terms of kind of the how much yoga and meditation are practiced with uh, in the US. And what you see is really an uptake from 2012 to 2017, both in yoga and meditation, up to 14%. And I would say that now it's probably in 17, 18, that's just my guess. But really what I'm saying with this, it's there's been an uptake, and a lot of this uptake has to do with science, or with research, and with the health benefits that people are finding in these practices. And so, in the <clears throat> late 90s, I, I um, started volunteering at MD Anderson, which I said it's a cancer center in Houston. I started volunteering because both uh, one of my teachers, Namkai Norberupache, and also my dad, both had different kinds of cancer. And that, and, and MD Anderson was very close by uh, to us. And actually, uh, I went to visit MD Anderson with Dad, who came from Argentina uh, for an appointment there. He's actually fine. He's 85 now. And, um, and, um, and so I started volunteering there. I asked them, and they were just starting with this place called Place of Wellness. And Place of Wellness was almost like a, a little spa. Out, right outside, it was in the same building. Of the main building of MD Anderson, there's a few buildings. There's 22,000 employees, so you can imagine there's many buildings. But what's interesting about this place is that even though it's in the main building, you had to go out 
the door, the main door, come and just come here. So it was almost like this secluded place that you came for kind of feeling better, right? So um, kind of the, what they would call, right, the psychosocial aspects. That this is in 98, 99, many of the medical establishment didn't really take this as important part of the cancer treatment or the cancer journey. A few years later, as we were doing these practices and many of them started being researched, then it became Integrative Medicine Center or the medicine program, Integrative Medicine Program, and it had three arms. Of course, the research part, but also the clinical care and the education. Um, I became director of the education part. But really, we were focusing, I mean, I wanted to bring three aspects that were important in how we focused our, our practices there. So one is George Engel, and you probably heard of George Engel, at least some of you, who kind of was the one in the late 70s who said we shouldn't just stick to biomedicine. Health is really at the intersection of not just the physical health, but also the social health and psycho-spiritual health. Now, at that time, we didn't have COVID, right? But after COVID, I think we all know that this is actually the case, how important psycho-spiritual and social uh, aspects are to our health. The other part is Arthur Kleinman in his illness narratives, and looking not just at the disease, in this case, cancer, but actually about the illness experience that the patient and his or her family goes through. And so seeing all of that was really important. So in our meetings at every Thursday morning at Integrative Medicine, when we would present the patients, it was not just <coughs> the 80-year-old woman with breast cancer stage two, but actually it was that this woman was coming from Virginia and she had two brothers and her mom had cancer rolls and you know, all these things, but also maybe that there was someone coming from another country that didn't speak the language, that didn't have insurance. How does it affect this experience? And then finally, Tibetan medicine. And one of the things that I always think of this mandala is that, you know, at the center we have this Buddha of medicine, and I always think of he or she as this enlightened being knowing, right, the suffering of all beings and having at his or her disposal all these different um, medicines. But also, those around there, that's like that eight o'clock meeting, right, where we were sitting around the table and discussing about the patients, and so what we wanted was for the patient, not just thinking of their physical health, but also their social and psycho-spiritual. And in fact, that's how we created the model. This was our model, or it is still the model, at MD Anderson's Integrative Oncology Consultation. So the mind body was part of it, the physical was part, the social was part, and trying to really look into optimal health and healing. So let me bring some of the studies that we did, particularly using Tibetan yoga in these populations. We started with people with lymphoma, both Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's, then we moved to breast cancer and then lung cancer. And I'll tell you a little why. Because a lot of times we would think, well, maybe the texts talk about these practices are specific for this cancer. No, the text doesn't talk about that in that way. They really are much more holistic in their approach. So the reason we went with lymphoma first, actually I'll be very honest, it was practical. One of the doctors uh, that was uh, in lymphoma, she was a Dharma practitioner, and she was in our Ligmincha Center, and she said, when we said, hey, we're interested in doing this study, why do you do it with our patients? Um, and so that's how we started that study. So I'll mention a little bit, that was our first study um, that got published in 2004 in Cancer Journal, which later I realized um, that it was the first randomized controlled trial of a yoga intervention in any cancer population. And then I'll tell you how we moved to breast cancer and lung cancer. Of course, 
for all these studies, there's always a lot of people to thank, that I, so I don't want to forget, so I put that thank you first. So in, as, as you saw in the way um, the National Institutes of Health and MD Anderson and most health institutions think of these practices, they think of mind-body practices. But really, in our traditions, in the Tibetan traditions, they talk about the gosum, right? The three doors. And the three doors are not just mind-body, but it's mind, energy body, or energy being kind of the link, right, between mind and body, that most of the times it's expressed through breath or through sound. So most of the practices are really mind-breath-body practices or mind-sound-body practices. The majority of the ones I'm going to talk today are going to be mind, breath, body, but I'll talk also about one with sound. And, and really in these traditions, what we tried to do, what I tried to do in, 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 in our research was really how do we man do the things that kind of research wants us to do? How do we play in their court? How do we play ball in their court? But without, without losing the essence of what these traditions bring. So for me, when Lorenzo Cohen, the director of integrative medicine at MD Anderson and the head of its research, asked me, what about doing a, a yoga, a Tibetan yoga intervention? My first response was, let me ask Lopon and Rinpoche, see if they're interested. And the moment they said yes, I was in. And Rinpoche, Tenzin Wanda Rinpoche, became an advisor to all these uh, studies. And so partly was, how do we bring these concepts into the practices, into the protocols, into the signing these protocols? My first position at MD Anderson was kind of interesting coming from religious studies. It was a mind-body intervention specialist. It took me like a year to understand what that position meant, but basically designing these studies so we could have measurements to evaluate them, right? But really, so I was interested in, well, how do these practices enhance, in many cases, actually even begin a meditative experience for these patients? Second, how can we see if they dispel certain obstacles, right? Whether it's physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and then how do they integrate it into everyday life? One of the practices that we included were the nine breathings that, as many of you know, deal with the three main aspects of mean, what we call sometimes poisons, of anger, attachment, and confusion. And one of the things that we struggled with is do we bring the subtle body in? And so at the beginning, we did these practices without incorporating the channels, but then we said we should. So we incorporated the channels. We talked about the channels and the chakras because the chakras relate to the five winds that I'll talk in a moment. And so these were part of actually um, what we were giving to the patients. And particularly, we work, these are in the Maju uh, and in the Atri system of uh, Tibetan yoga of Trungkor, these five kinds of breath that are also in Tibetan medicine, right? So the upward moving breath, the downward moving breath, the pervasive breath, the fire-like breath, and the life force breath. Right? And so in the Maju, for each of these five breaths, there's a movement. There's a movement related to the external aspect, which is more related to the movement itself, more internally to the breath, kind of what they call secretly to the mind. We focused on the five external for this protocol. And then we included also aspects of the Trung Corps, trying to maintain the integrity of the practices. And so we went with one of the, in the systems of the Shangshu Ninju of what they call the Nondro, which is the Nondro, the preliminaries or the foundational practices. And particularly in the way Shartsa Rinpoche explains them, because in the root text, there's one particular movement that clears six different parts of the body. And uh, Shartsa Rinpoche, in his commentary, kind of double clicks on it, and they become five distinct movements. So those are the movements that we included in that. And the way that we did it, we did a baseline assessment, 
we did seven sessions of yoga once a week, and then we did a one month, a three month, and a six month. Why did we do seven? Because as I was organizing, creating this protocol, I organized it in a way, okay, you learn this the first time, the first class, this the second, this the third, and then one to wrap it up. So it came to seven. So it wasn't just because seven is also a good number in the Tibetan tradition. And so this is the first article we published that I was mentioning in 2004 in Cancer Journal. And it was interesting because one of the main effects we found was in sleep. Sleep quality, sleep quantity, sleep latency, which is the moment you want to go to sleep until you fall asleep, and less sleep medicine. I have to say that back in 2004 when this was published, I was like, sleep? Is that all we got? But actually, we got a lot of media attention because they realize what I did, it, that sleep is so important. I think now we, I realize it more, but also in society we realize it more. And this was with patients with lymphoma, as I was saying, and we also realized that it's a relatively small population. So if we needed to do something larger, we needed to expand to a population that has uh, more patients, so we went to breast cancer. And we did a pilot with breast cancer, and we found similar, uh, similar results. And that allowed us to uh, get an R01, which is a, a large grant, actually was over $2 million, to study these uh, Tibetan yoga protocol in women with breast cancer. And particularly, we did it with chemother uh, undergoing chemotherapy. Why do we did, it with, did we do it with chemotherapy? A couple of reasons. One was that um, we realized when we did the pilot study I was mentioning that those women undergoing chemotherapy had better effects that, or larger effects than those doing radiation. And so that was one of the reasons. The second reason was that um, we could organize as they were coming to once a week for their um, sorry, by then the, the chemotherapy moved in the breast cancer, at least at MD Anderson, from once a week to three times a week. And so every three weeks we had them do the, the study. And so it was easier to design in that way, and it was convenient for the patients. And what we found and then published in one of the papers is that one of the things that our clinicians wanted to know, which is, What's the dose that we should recommend our patients to do? And what we found is that... So, if you remember this graph from Engels, what we wanted to focus now, one of our uh, researchers was really uh, interested in diets, right? So, um, diets means, you know, in, in her, in, in, in the way she saw it is the diet between the patient and the caregiver. And so really this aspect of the social component. How is this important in an intervention? And so in a way, she was interested in the connection between the patient and the caregiver. I was interested in the connection through meditation. So we kind of joined forces. And what we did is we did this study which was a couple-based Tibetan yoga uh, program. And what we did, a couple of things were different in this study. So one is that the caregiver was as important as the patient. So we didn't look at the patient, um, uh, at the caregiver just to support the patient. The caregiver goes through his or her own stuff as well. So can we see differences for them as well? The other thing that was challenging, it was a population that I always was a little bit uh, tentative with. These are practices with breath. These are lung cancer patients, right? But we thought, well, maybe we can improve at least a little bit. And again, one of the things I didn't mention about these Tibetan yogas, in all of them, we're holding the 
So you inhale, hold the breath, sometimes re-inhale, do a particular movement, and then exhale. So we were a little tentative, and, but actually it ended up being very useful. And the other part that was really useful, which my colleague was really happy, was actually of doing it together. And what we did as so you can see some of the results uh, in clinical levels, reduction of fatigue, of uh, sleep disturbances and depressive symptoms. But the other part that, that she was really happy and I was too is that, you know, when we taught to them, so like, you know, we would be the instructor teaching them kind of facing you. And then once we taught them, we said, okay, now as you practice, practice looking at each other. And so as they practiced, a couple of things happened besides the clinical aspect. They started connecting in a different way. Sometimes even during the practice, they allowed us to film them. They would reach out, reach out with their toes. They would also tell us that their relationship improved. And we felt that was really, really important. And so, and by the way, even though we call it couples, they didn't have to be a couple, but they did have to live in the same house. So we had, for example, some that were mother and daughter. There were some, so there were different, but it, there were two people living in the, in the same house. And so this was really an interesting study that then, and I'm not gonna talk about the other study, but we also did similar with other types of yoga because we felt that this area was really important. And then we, you know, actually we were, again, how these things happen. We were in an elevator with the then president of MD Anderson. And uh, I was with Lorenzo, and, and uh, Lorenzo was telling him about our research and all the things that we had done. And he said, but what about the brain? What, 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 what do you find anything in the brain? And, uh, and so we looked at what was being done in the brain. It sounds like mine in life, right? So, uh, and, uh, and so we, we looked, and as you probably know, uh, Solger Rinpoche or, or uh, Mathieu Ricard in Richie Davidson's lab, they had done some research, and some of it was published in terms of alterations in brain and immune function, but also in Sarah Lazar's lab on kind of increase of, of gray matter, but we were looking on what could be useful for people with cancer. And so one of the things you may know is something that they call chemo brain. So chemo brain is cognitive um, um, deterioration due to chemotherapy. And so we said, well, that might be an interesting area to study. How do we study that? And again, another colleague um, said, what about something with sounds that affects the area of, that, of the brain? And we went into this, again, this is a, a book by Tenzin Wander and Pache on, also from the Mother Tantra, these sounds. And one of the interesting things that our researchers liked was that for each sound, it was not just producing the sounds, but each sound had a different task. So for example, in this case, Aum Hung, and I know in other traditions is Om Hung, uh, and so, ah is clearing, has this aspect of kind of clearing the uncluttered stuff. Or clearing, sorry, the cluttering stuff. And then om, so ah is here, white light, om is here, red light, and is a sense of connecting to all your wonderful qualities. Usually, you know, we talk about the four immeasurables, right? Loving kindness, compassion, joy, equanimity, and then home is at the heart, blue light, and it's like bringing that into your life. So I is more like sky, home is more like the sun, home is more like the rays, right? And so the, in this protocol, um, what we did was also a randomized controlled trial uh, for women with uh, breast cancer uh, that had mentioned that they had chemo brain and, um, um, and then uh, what we did is they, we did both the nine breathings that I mentioned earlier and 
these sounds. And what we found was both in the area of, um, of um, objective measures such as the Stroop test that measures speed cognitive function, improvement in those who were doing the Tibetan sounds, as well as in the short-term memory, we use the Pittsburgh test. And then we saw in the perceived aspects of cognitive capacity, in intrusive thoughts, in mental capacity, again in uh, CSD and depressive symptoms, and in spirituality. And so these were all different reports. Again, it was published in Psycho-Oncology, and um, uh, it was actually, it was almost like a too-good study, because when we applied for further funding, they said, what else do you want to prove? And this was just a very small study, but they, so we never continued to uh, funding for that. But we used it for something else I'll mention in a moment. The other part that I think it's important, and Lorenzo was really interested in this, is, you know, sometimes we study, we try, you know, we're, we're playing in their courtyard. There, I mean, the, the, the medical scientific courtyard, right? And so what do they want to know? They want to know what's the active ingredient. So the moment you put all these things together, which is what we usually do, right? If you have some, you change your diet, maybe exercise, maybe include some meditation or yoga. Um, and so you put it all together. But then what do they say? But what was the change? So this one was really hard to get funded because it was a comprehensive study. And yet it had an important component of uh, yoga and meditation. But I have to say, one of the main components here that it was not the Tibetan yoga, it was the, the uh, health psychologist. How do we help them with the barriers that obstacleize them on actually engaging in these practices? So I wanted to mention this uh, for that, even though it's not the Tibetan yoga specifically. And the same, trying to reach to other populations, and particularly this was with Lorna McNeil um, in the uh, health disparities research area, and really going to areas where usually we, you know, uh, uh, populations that don't practice these yogas. And it was interesting because this was for churchgoers. And what we noticed was at the beginning, as we were designing the study with Lorna and her team, was we're not going to call it yoga, right? We, so we call it harmony and health. And in a way, internally, we call it the non-yoga study, right? And, uh, <laughs> but what was funny was, you know, that it was actually very well received. And then one of the practitioners told the yoga teacher, says, this was great. It reminded me of yoga. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, and because of all this, in the integrative medicine program, now we incorporate all these practices. So, so I was talking about Tibetan yoga, but we incorporate other forms of yoga. We incorporate music therapy. We incorporate acupuncture. So when we go back to that medicine Buddha mandala, all these different parts of how do we get the patient to be in its optimal health and healing. That's how we bring these to the clinic. So now we have practices that are open to all, uh, uh, both patients and caregivers, think specifically on breath following the protocol that we did, some on breath and movement, again, following the protocol that we did. And we actually evaluated this too. We evaluated the group practices, and I had an individual clinic. And what we found, even sometimes with one or two sessions, a reduction in anxiety, in fatigue, in distress, improving well-being, reduced sleep disturbances, depressive symptoms, increased memory, reduced pain. So these are things that we find, and this is why clinicians now adopt it, right? And this is just our studies, but there's so many studies now across the board. And so again, we to remind people, we put it in our websites, we have videos that people can uh, look at them. Originally, actually, when we did these videos, it was for the uh, inpatient population that couldn't come to the outpatient clinic. Um, 
but now they're in the internet, so you could be in Timbuktu and watch them as well. Um, as you can imagine, apps were the next step, and so together with the clinical director, Gaby Lopez, uh, we put together an app on meditation, both in English and in Spanish, and we're finding that it's, it's useful to, particularly we're measuring anxiety, kind of pre and post, and basically we put it, the app, we put it uh, not in an iPhone, so they have so many things, but we actually give them, what do they call, I, I forget what they call them, the, the small one that they don't exist anymore now, iPhone Touch, I think, iPod, iPod Touch. So we, we take everything out, and we just put that app, and so that's all they have. And, and so they go through the practices, and, and that kind of, that data feeds directly into our computers, and we can see the differences. And so right before they start the practice, it pops up, a Likert scale, 0 to 10, how's your anxiety? And then as they finish the meditation, the same thing. And then we uh, use some of this with people after stroke. Uh, again, this is a pilot study that we're still continuing. Uh, this one was interesting, at least to me, because I hadn't done with this population, which was uh, people with knee osteoarthritis that uh, they were actually doing a TDCS, which is transcranial direct stimulation for that, and then we added uh, uh, an aspect of meditation. Uh, we actually are in the middle of an R01 study with, with that. Um, and this was uh, a sub-study that just was published this last September, which was this area of, um, of um, post-traumatic growth, right? Um, which is really noticing that sometimes you go through a, a trauma, and then if you have the right intervention, there's actually benefit. And this is what um, we found in this study, that with that Tibetan yoga study, that same R01, as we looked at some other measurements, we found this uh, improvement. Um, as Michael wanted, these are the, the tech, the books. Uh, there's also online courses on it. Uh, so you can uh, practice that, or you can come tomorrow to Ligmincha. And um, as I close, I, I want to close back to the tradition, right? Because without the teachers, none of this would be possible. Um, this was a, a picture that was actually this year. Tenz Rinpoche went to visit Lopan back in Nepal. And, um, and so this is a photo, and it was so touching of the whole lineage. This is how I feel when I, you know, you know, we can see refuge tree, tankas, and so forth. So this is my refuge tree. So thank you. Of course, those are websites, uh, both the Ligmincha one, the Mind, Body, Spirit Institute, my own, and my email if you have any questions. But I think we have time for questions. Thanks for that wonderful presentation. Um, I'm curious about when you are teaching um, clients or patients about these yoga practices, how much are you giving them of like the theoretical or background, prescriptive kinds of knowledge, the imaginations around <coughs> um, what these yogas are and kind of how they connect to larger systems, right? Like when you're doing the true core practices, you're um, Vision yourself as a Buddha, right? You're not just your own kind of normal self often, right? Um, with the sonic practices you were talking about, the ideas of the uh, head being decluttering, uh, and also with the throat and the heart, how much of those are you giving um, to the patients? Yeah. And, and, and how do you like think about the connection between the ideas around them and the actual physical practices of doing them and how they interrelate with each other? Yeah, thank you. So two things. So let's start with the Tibetan yoga. Um, in the systems that that I've practiced, both in the in the Atri and the Shangchu Ningju, you don't necessarily visualize yourself as a Buddha when you do them. Uh, what you do is that um, you connect to your channels and and breath, 
And as you are at the end with each movement, as you're shaking and exhaling with sounds, ha and pe, at that time it's like you feel that everything, all your obstacles are cleared, and at that time everyone, not just yourself, right, is like a Buddha or enlightened being. So I do mention that. I do mention that there's a sense of, we mention, because I trained other instructors, so it's not just one instructor, one effect, but actually multiple instructors. Yeah, yeah. And so the idea that it is about releasing all these obstacles. And I tell them, you know, in our tradition, you know, we, we say, you know, everyone, you can think of Buddha, or actually the, sometimes the text would say, everyone like a being of light. Um, so, um, but we don't, and, and we tell them that they come from a tradition, but we don't spend too much time in the historical context. In terms of, of the sounds, um, so that's one. The other part, you know, and, and, and my teachers, and particularly Tenzin Wonder in particular, when, when we talk about these benefits of these practices, so there's, there's kind of the ultimate goal, right, which is enlightenment. But there's also the side, uh, kind of the temporary goals, which is, you know, feel better, uh, release obstacles. Maybe if, you know, if I am going through my cancer, maybe just feel a little better, release some of that pain. So those are also, and those are part of the gegsel, right? And so some people, the majority, first of all, the majority of uh, all of these studies that I mentioned, these are all neophytes. So actually, when I started in 99, um, which I, now I remember when we were giving them the practice, many of you don't know what this is, we gave them cassettes. <laughs> right? um, and, um, and you know, you would ask them, you would tell them that this was a yoga study. They'd be what? They had no idea what yoga was. Um, now, then we went into the other problem. Like, you tell them it's a yoga study, and then, but this is not yoga. So then we had to change the name. It, even though internally it was a yoga study, it was a stress management study, right? So, we, so and in terms of the so in terms of the syllables, in terms of the sounds, is really about this again, this clearing. So we in that one we 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 talked about body, speech, and mind, but we didn't talk about enlightened body, enlightened speech, enlightened mind. I guess the question that I'm asking is. Like what is the connection that you are, or if you're thinking about this, right, um, the connection between the ways that we consider and imagine what certain practices and, you know, bodily movements and sounds are going to do for us, and then how we feel afterwards, right? Like, if you just do these practices, like, without any of that knowledge, is that going to have the same effect as incorporating those imaginations? Like you said, when you were doing the true core ones, after a certain period of time, you started including the channels because you thought that would be helpful for them, right? right. Um, so like that kind of like adjustment, like how do those, I don't know, just how are you thinking about the connection between those two pieces? Like yeah, this? yeah, no, that's very important. And so one of the ways that we, we tried to kind of mediate that was, so when we got the grant, we went, so the, the first study, uh, which was the, the two first pilot studies, it was, the Tibetan yoga versus uh, standard of care, right? So there was, they did their, what they were doing, but nothing else. Uh, when we had more money and we, we got the grant, then we were able to include an active uh, uh, control group. That active control group actually did um, uh, movements. In this case, it was, by now, we were with breast cancer, so movements that women with breast cancer were doing, were asked to do by their PT, by their physical therapist. And, and we tried to create a protocol that was similar. And I have to admit, this was one of my most difficult challenges because clearly that was not my area, right? And so, but the way we did it is as we studied these manuals, can we have similar movements? So for example, in these breast cancer manual, there's a movement like this, that is particularly after mastectomy, right? And so in the Tibetan yoga, there's a movement that is like this. 
So we were trying to pair some of the, the movements that more or less they lasted the same amount so that the interventions themselves lasted the same amount of time. So we did include, uh, instead of saying, well, let's do the Tibetan yoga without all this stuff, what we said is, let's do the Tibetan yoga as complete as we can for this population and compare it to something that is already known that it's useful, which is this physical therapy for this population. And that's what we control. Yeah, yeah. to follow up on that, what did you see as a differential effect sizes between those, those groups, the, the PT movement and, and yeah. also in relation to that, was there any qualitative data or what data was captured to discuss that it would be any better than PT movements plus I'm healing, I'm good, mm. you know, my body is doing what it's supposed to do. You know, so I'm just curious about. Yeah, I know. I mean, you know, uh, so the last part I can't answer because we didn't do. Yeah. Um, but um, the, I'm, I'm trying to remember the, the size effects, but what was interesting it, with some of the measures um, you know, it was Tibetan yoga versus uh, stretching. We call it stretching and standard of care. In some cases, actually, it was much, we expected it to be a dose, right? So that standard of care was the less, and then stretching, and then Tibetan yoga. Yeah. And what we found is sometimes stretching was even less than standard of care. Sometimes we don't know why, if they were not practicing them right, if they were not practicing enough. So some of the things, uh, there's, there's only so much that we know. We did some qualitative, actually, publications as well. And, and again, uh, people uh, related to the Tibetan yoga, what we, what we did realize, too, is the more complex, the less they do it. Yeah, right. Right? So when you start asking them about which of these practices you do, so Trung Kaur would be the most complex. Yeah. So many times would be, okay, only a few people did. Salum, more people. Just the nine breathings, more people. Just meditation and staying, you know, just. <sighs> so so that's, what we, that's what we see. I mean, I'll definitely look at the articles. It's super interesting. Yeah, yeah, they're all in PubMed. But, you know, part of what you're saying um, is that there's well-established literature of mindset priming effects, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm just curious about, like, in the future. Yeah. I mean, I'm very sympathetic to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, like, how do you capture these mindset priming yeah. effects? The other part that the, we did look in some studies is expectation. Yeah. A lot of times, you know, the moment you say, this is a whatever study, a Tibetan yoga, a, a lot of people... You know, you ask them, so how much do you expect this will benefit you? Right? And then you, you kind of readjust accordingly. Thank you. Yeah. Other. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Yeah. So I'm curious, uh, to what extent, because you've sort of hinted this in the last two responses, were you either selective on the one hand of practices that you presented from the full systems of yoga that you're working with. And so selective. And then the other is, and to what extent were they adapted? In other words, not exactly as they were traditionally presented, but somehow modified or curtailed or customized to your patients. Yeah. So let me start with selected, then I'll go with modified. So selective, yeah. Um, we try to say, okay, how do we select them and still maintain the integrity? And actually, that's when Tenzin Wonder and Pache was incredibly useful because that's when, so I kind of design my draft, and then I go to Tenzin Rinpoche and say, what do you think of this, right? And so, for example, in their first study, we had nine breathings, we had the five external salung, and we had the five trunkor of Shartsa Rinpoche, right, of the Shangshu Ninju. Um, and, but for example, when we went to the study 
that was with lung cancer patients. We selected only two movements. We did the nine breathings on only two movements. The movement that relates to uh, the life force, but it's a heart, and the movement that relates to the lungs and air. And those were just the two movements. And so that, that's how we were selective. Adapting. Adapting, there's a couple of ways that we adapted. One is, what can they do? So for example, many times in that study in the lung cancer patient, the patient could do less of holding than the caregiver, and that is fine. But you know, in a way, this is also how we teach you know, in Lipich, it's like, you know, we find a lot of people, you know, we have, you don't have to be a cancer patient to have limitations, whether it's in the body and the breath and the mind. And so do what you can. And kind of my favorite phrase is kale kale. You go towards where you want to go, but you do adapt it uh, to where you are. So there are adaptations. Now, the other thing that you bring, which is, you know, we're going to get into much more difficulty, which is, you know, you said how they were traditionally practiced. This is an area, right? Because how do we, you know, I know... As they're presented in the... Right. Prescriptively. From right, but both in the text and then you go to ethnography, right? And, and so you go... So I was able to, you know, not only when I learned it the first time, I learned it one way. But what happened, and you probably have the same thing with other practices, right? You go to another lama, and you say, yeah, this is how I practice. Oh, you were doing it this way? No, we do it this way. Okay, this doesn't sound too much. But there are different, and then, when, and then it's like, so which one is it? Is there much difference? The text says, move the hand. It doesn't say this way, forward necessarily, it could be sideways, but not this way. So there are these nuances. And then what you see is different practitioners practice, and they say, well, my teacher told me it was this way, right? Um, including in the concluding movement, there's sitting ways of the concluding movement. There's standing ways of the concluding movement. So yeah, these are decisions that not only we make adaptations or decisions of how we do it with these populations, like people with cancer, but actually we do also as we teach in Ligmincha. So for example, you know, when we are planning courses, you know, I talk with Rinpoche and I say, you know, so sometimes it doesn't say, do you stand at the end, do you sit, do you, it says, so he would say, okay, let's do all sitting or all standing. So there's, there's a congruence in at least with that and so these are ways that are I think not just adapting to the population in terms of cancer so but to the population meaning teaching in the West you know the other part as we know right these practices were originally done for people and by people who this was their main practice their main thing in the day and they would do all their things around this. Exactly the opposite of what we do, right? We have all, our job, uh, our whatever, if we have kids, you know, whatever, whatever we, all the things, and then when do we have time for practice? Okay, where can I carve a little time? What do I do in medical school? I always teach at noon. Why at noon? Is that what it says the text the best time? No, actually it says it's one of the worst times. But anyways, it's because that's when they have time. So a lot of these adaptations have to do also with populations, whether they are, um, you know, ill or not ill. So I think it's adapting to, to our life. Yeah. But these are things to consider. One of the things I try to do, particularly in terms of, you know, holding or, you know, it's like, this is what the text says. Now, if you cannot do it, seven times or five, do it less, but know that that's where we go. Or these are certain positions. So I, I'll give you an example with myself. So I had a crash and I, so I broke this wrist many, many years ago. So there's movements that we sit and we put the palms, or, you know, we lift with the palms. I cannot do that. So I do them like this. But I tell the students, but this is how it should be done. I just cannot do it.
So, you know, so remembering that just because I have that limitation, I'm not going to now kind of pass on that limitation to others, right? So just explain, okay, this is how it should be done. I cannot do it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you had mentioned osteoarthritis and like uh, your research within that. I think I may have missed, like what were some of the findings in that? Were there improvements? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so that was a study, it was interesting. So that's a study that um, someone who was in the school of, um, of nursing at UT, uh, Dr. An, he had done a study with um, this TCDS, this transcranial direct stimulation and osteoarthritis and they found improvements. And he said, I heard about meditation can help, and so we, met, we put it together. And at the same time that they were getting their TCDS, we had a CD uh, to do the meditation, and there were more improvements that with that. And now we have a, an R01 grant, a, a larger grant, that we are not only doing that, we're also including sham TCDS and sham meditation. So uh, the sham meditation is basically something like breathe. Breathe again. So there's, there's something, but it's not the guided meditation, right? And so we're seeing, we're in the process of that one. I, I, don't, I, I, I can't share yet the, 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 the results, but kind of looking at the combination of TCDS by itself, TCDS with meditation, TCDS with sham, sham TCDS with meditation. So, kind of a cross. Yeah? That's great. Thank you so much, Ale. Appreciate you. you coming.